Hello everyone. So in the previous class or in the previous session, that is session two of environment, we're talking about IUCN. We talked a little about IUCN. We'll continue that. So we'll talk about IUCN a little bit more uh, about the red data book, the red pages, green pages, and all those stuff, pink pages. Those are important stuff, right? So let's not waste any time. Let's start and let's see how much more we can cover today. So IUCN, we have talked about that it is not an organ. Very, very important because UPSC specifically asked us that whether it is an organ or not. But it do, does have an observer or consultative status in UN. Established in 1948, it is world's first global environment organization. Runs thousands of field projects and everything. Now, let's see something more about IUCN. Let's see what else does it does. Means, what else do we need to know about IUCN? So again, 1948, world's oldest global environment organization. It has observer and consultative status in UN, as you all can see here, right? And it is involved in established, establishing WWF. Very, very, very important. What is WWF? Worldwide Fund for Nature. Worldwide Fund for Nature. And WWF publishes something called, or uh, is involved in something called, organizing something called Arthar. So Arthar, is organized by WWF. And I remember one thing in the previous class, we also talked about IUCN headquarters, which was in Gland, Switzerland. Right? It was in Gland, Switzerland. Similarly, WWF also has headquarters in Gland, Switzerland. This you can remember in this way that since IUCN is involved in establishing WWF, so, so they both have the headquarters at the same place, which is called Gland in Switzerland. Now, the important thing is this uh, IUCN, it uh, Right, I use in International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, and we do know sometimes and natural resources. The last part is not written, so it publishes red list of certain species and I use in red list of ecosystems. So these are the two things, major two things, which I use in publishes. Now let's talk about red data in detail. So just a second, yes. So I use in red data. Now in I use in red data, what is very important here is. What we need to understand is the green, pink, and red pages. These are very, very, very important, dude. If you know it, you know it. If you don't, even if you bluff here, your bluff will go wrong. Because generally, you will think the things which are in red pages, they will be more important than things which are in pink pages. We generally have a tendency. We, we give maximum importance to red color. Because red denotes what means, danger and all those stuff. So here, you have to be very careful. See, understand. Green, pink, and red pages. Green is for formerly endangered, but not threatened species so which are not presently threatened but which were formerly endangered these are listed in green pages in red pages of IUC in red data the species which are in danger that are listed but pink is much more important than red pages here because in pink we have critically endangered species are you understanding critically endangered means the species which are on the verge of extinction so pink critically endangered now if you want to see uh, a reliable source and you don't believe my notes but you should because I, I have taken it from other reliable sources only so we can we can always go to net and we can see it so yes green pink and red pages you can see here in google only although they have talked about green and red pink and red pages or in fact pink pages in the red data book they have talked about but they have not talked about red pages specifically so pink pages in the red data book this one critically endangered species so remember the pink pages are the most important pages in the red data book green pages which are formerly endangered but now recovered and red pages we have seen which are endangered Right now, let's go back. Let's see something else. So, IUC in red data, we have read, uh, we have also talked about WWF, that the headquarter of WWF is also at the same place where IUC in has its headquarter, which is in Gland, Switzerland. Now, let's talk about Kyoto Protocol. Let's move back and let's talk about Kyoto Protocol. Just a second, dude. So, Kyoto Protocol, we all know that it, uh, after the 1992 convention, Rio de Janeiro convention, they started talking about what we need to do and global warming is happening and human induced voting the co2 emission is causing the voting say i say what you can say a lot don't i so yes so kyoto protocol this happened this whole thing take place took place in kyoto in japan in 1997 and it came into force remember there are two different things if you go to even wikipedia page of kyoto protocol now you will understand what i'm trying to tell you just a second so i will show you so 1997, this whole thing take place, but it came into existence or it took. So th these are two different things. It came into existence in 2005. Why there is a lag of eight years, dude? What is the reason behind it? You will understand it. See, there is something called when you, you talk a lot, but then you have to implement it, right? Then you have to ratify it. How many countries are ratifying it? So all these things. See, I will tell you, there are different stages in Kyoto Protocol. 
first commitment period second commitment period second commitment period is not yet in existence because 144 countries you need ratification and only 137 countries have ratified it so we are talking about uh, it was signed in 11th of december 1997 but it came into force on 2005 that is eight years lag is there because the ratification there was a minimum number of requirement that it has to be ratified by at least 55 states and that happened after or what do you say on or before 16 february 2005 that's why there's a lag of signing an effective uh, what do you say signing date and effective date signing 1997 effective 2005 so this you have to understand so there are different commitment period so there was a first commitment period which started in 2008 again you know why there is a lag happening because the minimum number of state ratification which was needed that happened what do you say in 2008 so this, <coughs> sorry let me take a pause so yes so first commitment period started in 2008 and what does it mean? What does commitment period mean in terms of Kyoto Protocol? So it means that there are different countries which had given certain commitments, NX1 countries, non-NX1 countries, some were binding, some were non-binding. So what you need to understand is first commitment period started in 2002 and ended in 2012. In 2012 only, the second commitment period and it, it, it happened. But the second commitment period is not yet in force. You have to understand the second commitment period is yet not in force. You can see here also, it was drafted in 2012. The condition is, and why it is not yet in force? Because the condition is, it has to be ratified by 144 states. But right now, up until now, only 137 states has ratified it. The second amendment, the second amendment is called Doha Amendment to the Kyoto Protocol. Remember this, you must have heard about Doha Amendment, Doha Amendment and all those stuff. So Doha Amendment is a second commitment period, which was agreed in 2012. But remember one thing, it is still not in force. So this is very important. So again, uh, what happened? And this this extension period, the second commitment period, was to ex till, uh, what do you say? exist till 2020. But now, what will happen after 2020? So they had to talk. So they did talk, and the talk led to the adoption of the Paris Agreement. But this Paris Agreement, it is not considered an amendment or commitment period or an addition to the Kyoto Protocol. It is an entirely separate instrument under UNFCC. You have to understand. So because of the talks under Kyoto Protocol, this Paris Agreement came into existence and it is not a part of Kyoto Protocol. It is a separate instrument. These are the things which we need to remember. What are the other important areas that Canada initially ratified it and all those things, but now Canada withdrew from the Kyoto Protocol in 2012. US has never ratified it. So these are the important things. If you see about Canada, I will show you in my notes. There was one UPSC question also related to Canada. So if you want to see, I will show you. See, Canada initially was very enthusiastic about involvement and all those conservation things. But right now, I think they have taken a backseat. See, there was a question in UPSC prelims in, I think, between 2000 to 2016. You can get it. Which country was the first country in the world to enact climate act? by pass, passing climate change accountability bill. So Canada was the first country. So you see, initially in the starting period of 2000, Canada was very in enthusiastic, but now that thing has taken a backseat. They have withdrawn themselves from the Kyoto Protocol. So let's move back to Kyoto Protocol. Again, this is a this particular question, which country became the first country in the world to enact? It is a UPSC PYQ, and that's why I've written it here. Now let's move back to Kyoto Protocol. So again, Kyoto Protocol came into force in 2005. We know the history and whatever we need to know. We don't need to do PhD here. So again, there are different mechanisms, clean development mechanism, CDM, certified emission reduction, carbon credit, all these things, which is allowing <coughs> industrialized countries, NX1 countries, to invest in projects that reduce emission in developing countries. You can go through these different terms, not very important. Maybe they can ask you, so you still go through this. You need to understand. They do ask that this particular term associated with Kyoto Protocol in match the following type. So you should know that certified emission reduction, clean development mechanism, carbon credit, all these terms are associated with Kyoto Protocol. And they are allowing industrialized countries to invest in projects that reduce emission in developing countries. Now let's talk something more. Let's talk what are the gases or what are the GHGs? What are GHGs? Greenhouse gases. What are the GHGs which are um, which are there in Kyoto Protocol? So we do know that there are two commitment periods in Kyoto Protocol. Just a second. In the first commitment period, which was between 2008 to 2012, they added six GHGs. Six GHGs, greenhouse gases. Very, very, very important. Dude. These six gases you need to remember. What were those six gases? CO2 was there carbon dioxide, CH4 was there, methane, nitrogen, di nitrogen oxide was there, hydrofluorocarbon, HFC was there, perfluorocarbon, PFCs were there, and SF6, that is sulfur hexafluoride was there. So these six gases, you have to remember it, note it down somewhere, but do remember it, because they can ask you which of the following gases were not included in first commitment period, or were included in first commitment period. There's a very high probability of framing a question here. 
so carbon dioxide methane nitrogen oxide hy- hydrofluorocarbon perfluorocarbon and uh, sulfur hexafluoride so there are three gases involved with putting here fluorine now there was another gas ghg which was added in second commitment period and we have talked about it which is from 2012 to 2020 doha amendment and that was nitrogen trifluoride but since this never came into existence it right now still needs seven countries right because second second commitment period 137 countries have ratified it up until now and we need ratification of 144 countries right so that's why when you even go to the wikipedia page of kyoto protocol now you will see something i will show you they have not written this nf3 whatever was there in the uh, added in the second commitment period see they are still stuck on the six gases which was there in the or which was promised or which was added in the first commitment period these are co2 ch4 n2o hfc hfcs pfcs and sulfur hexafluoride so they have not added nf3 so again what you have to understand is this second commitment period is not yet into existence or in force so that's why that nf3 thing which we have just read that is not being accepted because when it will be ratified then only you will see the seventh gas added in the whole kyoto pro- protocol thing right so the ghg added in second commitment period was nf3 but it is still not being shown because the second commitment period is still not in force too so yes so this was about kyoto protocol and we have talked about kyoto protocol we have talked about uh, red data so let's talk about certain miscellaneous things what miscellaneous and again miscellaneous means again these are important dude because these are pyqs so bundala biosphere reserve they have asked it previously upsc so they have asked it it is located in which particular country it was added to unesco's man and biosphere program and it is in sri lanka this bundala biosphere reserve if you want to see it i will show it to you uh, just a second just a second dude green pink red and green pink and red pages we have done kyoto protocol we have done let's see bundala biosphere reserve now and then we'll talk about gambusia fish flying fox and all those stuff so this if you see here this is the map of sri lanka mm, i'm trying to open it but sometimes again what happens when you don't close your laptop for so many days it gets stuck dude which is happening in my case so bundala biosphere reserve it is not a map of india it is a map of sri lanka and if you know sri lanka is very small compared to our country so in the tip of this southern portion you see the bundala national park and it is in sri lanka since they have upsc has asked it before they can ask it right so bundala biosphere reserve we have done now let's talk about something else or shall we talk about it in the next session let's talk about it gambusia fish again they have asked it which of the following fish help in controlling mosquitoes so gambusia fish this is a upsc pyq i'm not kidding so gambusia fish helps in controlling mosquitoes so these are miscellaneous things which we should know these are one what do you say because if you know it you know it if you don't if you don't right very high chance of getting it wrong if you're bluffing it so gambusia fish helps in controlling mosquitoes now let's see gambusia fish so we have seen bundala biosphere reserve it is in sri lanka let's talk about gambusia fish this curipa is a gambusia fish all these i don't understand what is the difference between different fishes right we have to do fishy culture in detail to understand the difference but this whole thing is a gambusia fish cool dude now let's talk about flying fox gambusia fish we have done explosion in mines that happens because of the combination of methane and air now what are the sources of methane this is also very important no kidding again a previous year question sources of methane what are the rice field that's why they say that in india the source of methane is very high because we have extensive rice fields so rice fields coal mining explosion in mine see the relationship see how they are asking questions so coal mining rice fields domestic animals the excreta they which they release that is a source of methane wetlands all these things so these are source of methane now flying fox flying fox is a species of bat it's, it is a mega bat flying fox flying fox is a mega bat we'll keep until here only again this is a question which it was i if you remember sorry i sometimes stammer if you remember in the previous class or in the first session i guess we talked about sea horse sea lion and all those things which is mammal and which is not similarly they have asked what is flying fox it is a mammal or something like that it is a bat if you want to see flying fox and it is a very notorious kind of a bat <coughs> sorry so this is a flying fox so this is a mega bat it's not only a bat it's a mega bats don't get confused since fox is written but it is a bat Cool, dude. So again, this is also a UPSC PYQ. That's it. We'll keep until here only in the next session. So three uh, sessions of environment has been done. Six session of quality has been done. In the next session, I will talk about S N T. Whatever notes I have made. So that's it. Fine. Thank you. God bless you all. Stay safe.